Hey, hey, and welcome back to Pianist Academy. My friend Fred Viner, who is a composer and fellow YouTuber over in the United Kingdom, uh, reached out to me a few months ago with a new piece of music, and the piece is called Night Air. He very kindly dedicated the piece to me, so thank you so much, Fred. That, that's super, super meaningful. I really appreciate that. Uh, and we were talking about the piece, and we both agreed that it would be a great opportunity to do some teaching. And instead of teaching maybe, let's say, teaching from a teacher's perspective, right, I thought it would be fun if I take you through the process of learning a new piece of music as if you got to see it through the eyes and brain, let's say, of a concert pianist. In this case, that concert pianist is going to be me. So we're going to go through this completely new piece of music. It's never been recorded before. It's never been performed before. It has only been played by Fred himself, the composer. And I'm going to talk you through, kind of narrate as much as I can, the process and what's going on in my mind and what I'm listening for uh, as we go from literally not having played a note of the piece to, at the end of this video, a finished performance. And we're going to try to do that all in one sitting. So that's possible. It is made possible by the fact that this piece is a piano miniature, as Fred calls it. It's two pages long. It's just under 40 measures of music. Uh, so it is going to be possible for us to kind of go through all of it and in a lot of detail because it's a short piece. So if I were teaching a piece from a teacher's perspective, I would always tell a student, go out and find a recording or a handful of recordings that you like of the piece, study those and, and kind of absorb what those performers have done with the music, right? A lot of times as professionals in music, we're invited to play pieces of music, learn pieces of music, perform them that have never been performed before. And it's a, such a cool opportunity, right? Because we get to experience music that is completely new to the whole world. In this case, I can't go and listen to a recording of the piece. There isn't one. So we're going to have to skip that step that normally would be one of the first things that happens anytime you go through a piece of music. And even myself, if, there, if I came upon a piece that I had never played before and I wasn't familiar with it, I would probably go and start with listening to a recording just to get super familiar. So we can't do that. So we're going to skip that step. The next thing that I would do kind of depends on the length of the piece. So in this case, we talked about it's just under 40 bars. It's two pages long. It's a very short piece of music. So I'm going to start with just a bit of analysis of kind of what I see going on in the sheet music before I play a note. I kind of cap that at, well, let's say like four pages or 80 measures of music or something. It's, it's, it's not a hard and fast rule, but if it's a short piece, I like to do a little bit of analysis. If it's a longer piece of music uh, that I need to experience, I'm going to dive right into sight reading it and maybe making some notes as I go. But today we're going to get to the sight reading part second. And instead, we're going to start by talking through kind of what I see on the page and then we'll go from there. Okay, of course, some of the first things that we always talk about when we see a new piece of music, we've got the key signature. Uh, in this case, okay, three sharps, it's either A major or F sharp minor. We just look through the piece, second page, it's F sharp, right? So we've got F sharp there. We've got a final chord of F sharp minor down there. I could even play. There's a little bit of that first bar, right? Just kind of that motion, we can definitely tell. That's F sharp minor. Very nice. Second thing, let's look. Oh, it's in cut time. Cut time is a lot like 4-4, four, four, except we're going to be counting in half notes. So even though there's going to be four quarter note beats here, two, three, and four, we're going to feel the pulse is two through the bar instead. So that's going to be important. F sharp minor, cut time. And cut time matches the tempo marking he's given me. Andante tranquillo. Uh, half note equals 80. So once again, he's telling me count by the half note. Beautiful. Love it. That all makes sense. Okay. Now I'm going to go through and look for, can I see any patterns in the score before I start to play? Or can I identify a little bit of the form of what's going on? So if we start here, I'm not going to draw over any notes, but as we get started, this is kind of like an A section and it goes. Oh, well, we've got two bars. These two bars looks like one and two repeat exactly in five and six. Yeah. And then three and four. Three and four are very close to um, seven and eight. Okay, so there are a couple little differences there. Maybe I'm going to mark this one in blue just to show that it's a little different. Uh, then we get some new material in nine. Looks like there's going to be some neat harmonies. There's this uh, walking, stepping down bass line that I'm paying attention to, except at the end it goes back up. So I can make a little mark there. Um, Nice. We've got a lot of C, C sharps on the top of the hand here, repeating some syncopation. 
that's cool. I'm not yet really paying attention to the dynamic markings or things like that. I'm looking for patterns in notes, uh, a little bit of patterns in rhythms, mostly just seeing kind of how things, how things fall in the hand and, and the shape they take on the keyboard and how, how I'm going to navigate things, right? Um, one important thing now that I'm going back and looking, uh, we've got, let's put it in black here, we've got lots of shifts, it looks like, over left hand, coming over the right hand, uh, where all of those clefts change, right? Uh, so that's going to be something that might be a little tricky to sight read, but something we've got to keep uh, track of, right? Okay, so we're in the B section down here, measure 9. Uh, once again, we've got a very similar 13 and 14. There's a couple things that are different, um, but very, very similar. There's this nice climbing out. And then in 17, well, this is really interesting. In 17, we've got the main, let's say the main melody like we had up here in A. We've got it except it's stemmed down. And, cool enough, these stem up notes here and here and here, to me, I think, we'll see when I play it, but they kind of reminisce to back in measure nine, what I was seeing as the top. And in fact, some of the rhythms actually line up between the B section and now when we get into 17. 17 is, uh, we could kind of call it A prime. We'll just call it A prime for now. Because uh, very similar to A, we've got the main melody. It's just been expanded. Okay, now we get into 20, 21, 22. 23, this is significantly different than what we had before. Cool, 24. Now as we get into 20... Four, five, twenty-five, which is twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. This bar right here, right. So as we get into twenty-five, we've got similar motion as we had in the B section of the previous page. Yeah, it's up. Uh, it looks like it's up an octave. So that's cool. Uh, and then we get some new motion here in twenty-eight, twenty-nine. So you see, as I'm going through all of this, I'm just trying to figure out, before I read anything, where are things that are familiar, especially after I play the first eight bars, where are things that are familiar? When I play uh, bar nine and ten, where are things, are things going to come back? Um, so after I experience it once, can I draw a connection right away to new things? 29 looks like it's going to be different. Let's kind of highlight that in green. From there to the end looks kind of like a, like a coda or something like that. Okay, that's cool. I think that's enough... Uh, going through just the the, uh, the piece itself and doing some analysis, I think that's good enough for us to get started. So, next thing I'm going to do is using some of that knowledge that I've built, I'm going to do a first sight read through the piece. And when I do a first sight read, my priority is going to be on playing every pitch correctly. I want to get my hands in the right place. I want to experience the crossovers that I mentioned. I want to make sure I'm playing all of the right notes so I can learn the harmonic context, so I can learn exactly what's going on, hear exactly what the melody line is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to secondarily prioritize rhythm. So I'm going to take a pretty slow tempo. Actually, 80 beats per minute is, is well, pretty quick for a half note. Uh, something like the snap is around 80 beats per minute. We'll have to check that. <laughs> but I think it's around 80 beats per minute. So I'm going to go a lot slower than that, because what I don't want to do is I don't want to mess up. I don't want to get any of the notes wrong. I want to get all of the pitches right if possible, and as many of the rhythms right as possible, but I'm going to err on the side of slowing down and taking extra time to make sure I get the pitches right. I've always found that, uh, at least for me in my own playing, and probably for many others out there, uh, if I get the hand positions right and the finger motions right on the right pitches first, or as soon as possible, I learn things a lot faster. If I, if I tend to get rhythms wrong, they're pretty easy to correct. If I get pitches wrong or I'm in the wrong place, those tend to be really hard to correct. So I want to get the pitches right and my shifts right as soon as possible. Okay, let's dive in. Here is a first sight reading of Night Air. Let's see how it goes.
messed up a little there in 18. There is this really cool motion down here in the left hand that I didn't notice right away, so I'm gonna go back and grab that. It's like a second voice. Actually, I'm going to just mention that you notice how from 21 um, on to the rest of the page, you notice how I probably took that a little bit faster. It's because I recognize that there was a lot of similarities in 21, 22, and then when I got to 23, it was a new thing, so I slowed down. Now moving on to 25, this is similar to what we had. One of the other things that I actually did while I was going through this um, that I didn't even realize that I would be doing is looking at all the other markings that are around. So, you know, throughout the piece we had pianissimo sempre. Uh, I was taking kind of stock of all of those other markings and making sure that I just know what they all mean. Sometimes we can find a piece of music that we haven't played before. There might be terms that we haven't seen. Um, I want to find out what those mean right away. So, I mean, two of the uh, one of the trickiest ones, it's very common if you play a lot of classical music, but on the second page here, 32, smorzando means dying away. It's a very common term to use uh, at the end of a piece of music, or especially maybe at the end of a big section or something like that. So smorzando is dying away. Of course, we've got a multi rid at the top of the page, and then less motion. Sonore, uh, sonorous, just, and of course these um, uh, ties that are kind of going to nowhere, those just mean let vibrate, we'll say let vibrate instead of the technical um, <laughs> French. But um, so we're just gonna let that ring, probably with the pedal because we can't actually hold it all down with the hands. That's great, okay. I'm gonna leave some of these markings on the page. Not that one, and let's actually go back. I don't need that one to be on there. Okay, so I had this first experience through the piece. Um, most of this is, it feels okay feels pretty good. It's not going to be too tricky to handle. There's nothing technically crazy, right? Some of the things that I'm going to really watch out for as I continue to work on the piece. One, making sure right at the beginning, this phrase that's in the right hand. There's a lot of motion around that phrase in the accompaniment pattern both in the left hand, but the melody is not da 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 da. It's not four notes, this is separate. Da 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 is the melody. So, and then with the left hand crossing over every half, every bar, I really wanna make sure that that left hand part stays so, so transparent. And I think that's aided by the harmony that's here, right? The left hand is only playing this open chord, and then we get something different, right? But the right hand is the one, and the melody is, the, is what's responsible for shaping that harmony more. So, and then especially right here, right? Uh, this guy, that is not uh, a melody note, the stem is down, so I need to really be careful that I don't play that out too much. Not like this. Whoops. Uh. It's not da 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 da, but it's just da 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 da. Okay, so I'm gonna take a little bit of time now and I'm gonna go through the first two lines of this piece, just the A section, that what we call the A section. And the first two bars, and then bars five and six, those are probably gonna be pretty easy to have nice uh, pretty quickly. And then I'm gonna see what happens as I need to differentiate bars three, four, and bars seven, eight. I need to experience them a little bit more to kind of find out what's going on. So here we go, we're gonna start back at the top. Pianissimo sempre, always pianissimo. I don't like that pedal. 
So right there, can I play both of those bars with just one pedal? I think that's good. And then I gotta make sure I go all the way to the end of that phrase. Da -da -da -da. Even though there's a decrescendo written there, yeah? So I think Fred's done a nice job here. He's put the crescendo mark and the decrescendo mark. They're above the middle, the midline of the, of the staff, right? So I'm assuming that means it's only the right hand that crescendos. Dun, da, 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 da. And especially not that E sharp. And then it comes back. That's, that's cool, I like that. So we're gonna take things in one pedal. And then we'll change up the harmony. I think that can all be one pedal. You'll have to tell me, Fred. So a lot of times, Fred and I didn't do this, but a lot of times if a uh, pianist or any musician is working with a composer, a contemporary composer, um, many times it's the composer that reaches out to the performer and asks for the piece to be played, right? Like a premiere or for a recording or something like that. And um, it's in everybody's best interest to, for both parties to work together, the performer and the composer, especially for the first, the premiere or the first recording, because um, we always want the first run through, the first thing that people hear, the first thing that goes public, to be <laughs> composer's representation, or the representation of the composer's intentions, closest to that, right? So Fred, feel free, <laughs> feel free to make a comment because we didn't talk about this. I'm gonna assume that you don't want all this to be choppy because of the crossover, in which case it has to be pedaled, pedaled down for that whole harmony. So I'm gonna assume that that's the right way to go. Fred, if I got it wrong, let me know. <laughs> Okay, moving on to measure five, we've got a repeat. That's all the same. So that's cool. That is offset in the left hand here. That's offset by an eighth note. Dun, da, da. I like that. That's very neat. And then we have this extra articulation that I really need to be sure I remember to play. I don't even know if I got that right on the first go around. Okay, back at measure five. One pedal, offset. And then I wanna keep these two things separate. I want this left hand to kind of be in its own box and then the right hand to be doing its own thing. So I don't want to play necessarily. I think Fred would have linked things together with stems if he wanted that kind of motion. So because that didn't happen in the score, I'm gonna call that in the left hand, da -da, the ending. And then we get into the B section. Okay, before I go on, I'm gonna go through this again. Uh, and I want to make sure that I'm going to get all the stuff that, I, that we've just talked about. I want to try to get it as, as correct as possible, as soon as possible. I'm doing all this without worrying about the final tempo or the performance tempo, anything like that. But I am worrying about dynamics and articulation and bringing things out, right? Hmm, one pedal, one pedal. Ah, you see that. So I just noticed this now. There is a difference in the ending here, right? We have one slur that is across all of that. And the next measure on the next system that's similar, we don't, it's broken. So I'm probably gonna play that differently. Yeah, so that's all just gonna be subdued because it's a part of, let's say the left hand or the accompaniment figure, that's all just gonna get subdued. We don't want it to cloud or we don't wanna think that's part of a melody line, right? So let's go back to the top. And then we 
we can go into the B section. Pretty nice, pretty nice. There are a couple things that I want to think about about pedaling in measures seven and eight here. Do I want one pedal? I think I still want one pedal. Yeah, I think I still want one pedal. Similar to how we did in the previous line. So what, what I'm kind of thinking about is also, do I want to highlight that harmony that resolves? Or do I want to keep the pedal tone of F sharp that we've had throughout this whole thing? Hmm. For consistency's sake, I think I'm going to keep the pedal tone. I might change my mind. I don't know yet. It's a, it's a cool little, little bit, uh, a little pedal enigma. Because it doesn't obscure the melody at all. But it doesn't really fit. So I think I'm going to keep one pedal because it sounds kind of strange to have things cleared so much after six bars of so such a nice texture uh, and, and atmosphere being formed. Atmosphere. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that word. Atmosphere. Atmosphere in the title, night air. I like those, the way those two words, uh, the way atmosphere and the title kind of go together. Let's do one more run through from A, uh, and then we're going to move on to the B section. And actually this time through, let's see, can I challenge myself and play a little closer to the intended tempo? Okay. Those are the eighth notes. And this, this is 80 to the half note. Ah, pretty good. I need to clean up a couple things because um, I'm still reading the notes. It's not super familiar, familiar yet. Uh, there were a couple little transitions, like the pedal in one place. I think on, on the cross to the second system, that I didn't love. Let's see. So I've just gone straight in. So what I felt like, the reason I went straight in was because it felt like I was kind of on a roll. I got things really close to how I'd intend, I'd want them as a performer in the A section. And then trying to feel how that links together into the new material. B, the B starting in measure nine, I've only played once when I did the sight read. Um, so that was really nice to feel how it leads into. And we have some, this kind of static, more stillness at the end of nine, 10. And there isn't, it isn't quite, because the right hand is still playing. Ah, but that syncopation, that's nice. So how we're holding from here, right, across the bar. So I really want to make sure that we hear that precisely. Precisely. Hearing rests precisely, or hearing, it's almost like silence, right? Hearing the nothingness precisely. That plays a lot into yeah, let's say in this piece in particular, I feel like it's a juxtaposition against this is always da, 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 da. There's always eighth notes happening here. Five. So there. There was the first time that's in measure eight. This spot right here is the first time where we don't have an eighth note kind of pulse that's been guiding us. So that's gonna feel different to begin with as soon as we get to eight. And then we need to make sure that we continue to highlight that that kind of thing is happening in nine and 10 where we're waiting. Yeah, cool. Okay, now let's dive a little bit more into measure nine. It says mezzo piano, so we've got a crescendo out of eight. How far above pianissimo 
is mezzo piano is one question. Secondly, dolce means sweetly, dolce and diminuendoing, at least until the end of the line. That's cool. He hasn't given us a dynamic marking at the end of the diminuendo, right, which would be here. There isn't a dynamic mark there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play it as soft as possible, <laughs> going back to probably pianissimo. And then we'll crescendo back, back to mezzo piano, right? This isn't uh, it doesn't have dolce written again, but we do have some other markings in 13. We've got these hairpins down for the left hand. Um, so we'll have to see what that's like. So maybe a 9. <laughs> 9, the intention is to hear the syncopation in the right hand. Yeah, it's not really syncopation. Just in the middle of the bar. And then across. I guess there's some. So hear that and let the left hand just be a nice texture underneath. So if I play the left hand, actually, maybe more like the left hand is piano, and pl I'm still pl I'm playing this with the soft pedal, and really trying to make the attack of the left hand kind of more amorphous, less distinct, and that way I'm bringing out more of the right hand. We're still feeling pulse, right? But it's not quite as in our faces. From the top there, right? So I need, to, I need to do a better diminuendo than that. That was kind of, I felt like the C sharps were poking out a little bit too much. I need to make a better line down. So I'll work on that in a minute. Leaving measure 10, 11, where I've marked pianissimo here. Leaving measure 11. Should I mark some fingering down there? If it was a harder line, I might. There are a lot of ways to work around that line, and I feel like... Hmm. Two. I'll write it in a fingering, but I don't know if I'm going to get it right every time, <laughs> at least not today. So I'm going to end on four on G sharp. Two. Yeah. Two, three, one. So da 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 da, two, three, one. Four? No. Three, maybe two. Oh, two makes it nice. It's just one change in position. put two there, and then the rest we can kind of just fill in. <laughs> so now, measure 13, I need to change the way I'm thinking about this, because first time around it was all about the right hand and obscuring the left hand. This time I want to bring out the left hand. And do I need to put a different finger on there? Let's see. I think I'm going to do that because this is all going to be pedaled once. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm looking at here is the fingering choice in the left hand. Instead of taking this in one position where I have to move five, which is going to kind of cause me to land on the downbeat. Yeah, that's too much accent. And we want that as the downbeats are actually the quietest bits in the left hand. So over the syncopated high note in the left hand, if I switch my thumb from being thumb here 
to playing thumb on the next note. I'm gonna try to do that for each bar. And then I play down to four instead of five. So let me take a minute and actually go through those bars a couple times. So going to thumb, thumb, five, thumb, thumb, five. Again. The other thing that I think I'm gonna to have to do here, I think I'm gonna really like the sound if I use less pedal, but I use more finger pedaling. So, So I'm doing a lot of holding down the entire harmony that the left hand is building. So that if the pedal needs to raise, let's see. For example, I might really want to raise the pedal on the lowest melody note here. Let me play around with that a little bit. So you see, <laughs> there's a lot of shifting back and forth, right? So I was thinking about left hand for just a couple passes, but then as I was thinking about that, I'm starting to think about how the melody is gonna take part in what's going on and what the pedal's doing and how it's all gonna mesh together in the final product. So if I've got the pedal down, I don't like how much of the melody I'm losing or how much, it's just getting a little muddy. Uh, and it was nice back in measure nine because there was less going on. There was less in the left hand to take away from what we're hearing in the right. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do there is actually pedal and I'm gonna lift pedal. I need to clean some of this up so I can actually remember what I really, really want to do. <laughs> I'm going to lift pedal, that's what that X means, at the bottom, and I'm, actually, and I'm not going to hold the right, right hand notes, but I am holding the left hand notes. So even when I lift, there's the pedal is off, but they're still all resonating. I'm just clearing the right hand. I like that. Oh, and I really, ah, because of where the harmony goes, I really want that to expand. <laughs> but it doesn't, it goes the other direction. Okay, okay, Fred. <laughs> I'll, listen. I'll listen to what you wrote down. Okay, so I've gone through the A section, the first A section, and the B section. Now I think it's time, I need to actually play the B section a little bit more especially to differentiate the first time through the first four bars of it, the second four bars of it, let's make sure that I can bring out the left hand the way I want to. That might take a couple iterations or a couple passes to get that really comfortable. So here we go, here's from measure nine. Bringing out the right hand. Softer. Yeah, I need to do 13 again, so let's do it slower. Mm, so cool, that's so cool. It's the same exact line, but it goes somewhere totally different back into our F-sharp minor 7 in 17, then our E dominant 7 in 13. Yeah, that's cool. So, okay, 13 still needs some more work to really get that left hand comfortable and the pedal with the finger pedal. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> So I know Fred's intending this to all be decrescendo at the end of 16 here that he's written down, but I really like kind of faking people out maybe. Can I do a little crescendo? 
before we obscure the arrival in 17, not obscure the arrival, but before we kind of go the opposite direction than maybe what we're predicting, right? And maybe even, maybe, I don't know, I, I think I like that. That would be something, I'm just gonna go with it today. But if Fred and I were talking, I'd bring that spot up and say, hey, can I, can I do this? Can I do that, Fred? <laughs> okay, let's go back to B. Let's play all B from measure nine. So that bar 19, 19 is going to take a little bit of uh, just memorizing kind of where that's going. I think B feels pretty good. Um, I need to play around with a little more just how much the left hand is going to come out. Do I really want the left hand to be more important? Do I want to hear the left hand high note more than the right hand low note? Or is the intention here still to keep in 13, to keep the left hand accompanimental, but just with a little more flow than the way we played it in nine, which is totally kind of obscuring the attack. This is measure nine. I need to start louder for mezzo piano. Piano, pianissimo. that's coming together nicely. I might still need to do a little bit more practice in 13 or at least linking 12 and 13 together um, because especially after I play the same pattern in 9, 10, and 11, I tend to want to play it the same way again in 13. So I need to make sure that I don't do that. Let's move on for now. Measure 17. Oh, so this is going to be probably... These bars are probably going to be the trickiest ones to play exactly the way I want them to be played. Because we, now we have three things going on. Before we just had like a texture, right? And it happened that the texture was crossing uh, over. So it was almost like there were three things, but the, it was just texture in two places. Now in 17, we have this C sharp on top. And then E. That should be C natural. Let's go back. Let's experience just that a little bit. It almost feels like kind of a bell ringing. Aye. C natural. And then we have a bell again. And then we're done with that. Let's do that one more time. So I'm focusing on the right hand first instead of the left hand. Instead of the left hand upper notes, let's focus on the right hand first. One more time, maybe. One more time. I like how I'm finally getting the <laughs> C natural in the last measure of this first page. Um, whoops, that is, yeah, that's an E. And then E sharp, C. Cool. Now let's go back and let's focus a little bit more on the left hand. Maybe we're just once alone. Yeah, nice little counter melody. Da, 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 da,
Hmm. There isn't a stem up there on the C sharp. But there is a tenuto. And tenuto is how that has been marked to bring out in all the measures previous. So I think that is the end of the upper line here. So if we go back to measure 20 at the top of the page, we have a da da da. Here's the restatement of the melody here, or the restatement of this theme. Da da 21, 21, yeah. Da da. Here's 23. Ba ba da. So I think that's the melody, or the counter melody, I should say. So if we try to put that together, maybe. Da, 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 That's going to be a little tricky to lean into and then resolve and then nice okay let's just put that together for now so 17 i'm only going to play these bell like uppers and then i'm going to play the left hand the whole left hand but work on bringing out all the notes that are marked with tenuto So I'm taking 23 and 24 a couple times over again because I really want to hear how that is translating. I think that's where it's going. There isn't a marking over the A, so I hope that's okay. Now, let's go back to 17. Let's only put in the melody without these bell figures. So you see, as I'm going through this, I'm just thinking about all the different layers. How can I pull them apart? How can I experience them? some of them at the same time, eliminating some, and then when I put them back together, I'm only doing parts of it. So instead of jumping back into 17 and doing the whole, the whole thing, just adding the main melody, the main motif that we established back in bar one, instead of adding that right back in with the upper bell-like notes in the right hand, instead of doing that, I'm going to eliminate the upper notes in the right hand, just play the melody. Let's hear how that works together with the counter melody. Again, under tempo. First time around, back in measure four, that would have resolved down. Da, da, da. Yeah, okay, that's just a different resolution. It's just going up. Nice, okay, let's do 17 again. Let's do that all again. So part of, part of, of course, practice for everybody. Uh, I'm doing less of this today because it's, it's not technically a challenging thing, but spots that don't fall into the hands super easily, of course, we need to spend more time with um, and just experience more and more and more, right? So, and the only thing that can really solve that kind of work when that needs to happen is just repetition. So I'm just gonna go back and do 17 again, maybe a couple times. I miss the C natural. <laughs> da, da, da. Okay, it's coming together. Let's do it again. Mm-hmm. 
So really important there in 23, this stem up isn't just an eighth note. It is a quarter, so I do need to hold that because we are pedaling here. We need to hear that across, maybe lots of pedal changes, and then up to the top. Let's add in the bells back in, let's see, slowly. again because that <laughs> two resolutions that are happening differently in the right hand are tricky to get really really nicely and the left hand is also doing something different so I wonder if I can do that can I finger legato or finger pedal um, that guy across the bar lowest F sharp there because when I do a lot of pedaling so all through there I'm just I'm trying to pull out things out of the texture of course the high note is usually what the melody is but it's not in this case but it's a counter melody and it still needs to resolve right but that's the actual melody. And if I pedal on every quarter note, we completely lose the lowest bass note. But it's kind of far away. Hmm. I'm gonna have to practice that. If I do want to hold that, I can. Let's keep going. Let's go back and do that all again. So one of the things I'm starting to listen to and starting to hear is that maybe because the melody's already been established back in bar one, Is that enough that when we play in 17? Yeah. Is that enough that maybe not in 17 do I bring out the upper C sharps, the bells, even though they've got tenudos. Maybe I don't bring them out so much there, but I bring them out more in 21. Be a possibility. Let's see how that leads together. So I'm going to go back to the pickup into measure nine, the B section. Right hand. Softer. nicely. Maybe I won't do as much of bringing the bell out in 21 to the end of that section. Didn't seem like it really needed it, especially after that I feel like I have to land nicely in measure 20, but then have that subside so quickly. Let's just jump into the end. Let's dive into more detail in the end uh, and see where we end up. So this is familiar. That shape is just the G sharp has been uh, shifted up an octave. Same harmonies we had before, just new chord voicing. That 
that's a turnaround. We didn't go back down to G in the past when we had this. We went up to B. So in 27, let's make sure that I go down to G there. Whoops. Crescendoing up a little bit to just piano. I think the notes, there's an accent there for a reason in 29, those three notes in 29 and 30. So, uh, it almost feels like it's two layers that are kind of working together on the same note. Uh, let's see. Like it's a bell, like is reminiscent in, in the middle section when the A material came back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those are the right notes. So. Come on, Charles. <laughs> because they're all phrased together, I feel like this. That still is part of a melody. It's not just. Mm -hmm. The melody still needs to be the three notes that are under the slur. Okay. Now this is kind of hard to see, but um, it almost looks like you'd re-articulate this F sharp at the end, but you don't. There are four ties in 31 here. There's four of those ties. So all four of the notes in 32 are tied. It's just a middle voice has been created there. That resolves. Small sando. Dying away, and then Menomoso. Menomoso just means less motion. Mm, I'm thinking it could be kind of up to interpretation about whether that's less motion in a strict tempo, or if it's just less motion and retarding. I really like the way it feels. It feels almost kind of jazzy. like that. And it's a little bit more free tempo rather than just menomoso in a strict count, right? Let's see if I can play from 20, the end of 24, the pickup in 25, to the end of the piece in tempo, right? So tempo is, what do we got here? That's about right. Okay. Put the resolution too soon. And I'm going to lift pedal right on a downbeat. Yeah, okay, let's do that again. Pianissimo, dolcissimo, extra sweetly. <laughs> Your favorite dessert. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Okay, so I think I've talked through just about everything that I am paying attention to. So let's do this. I'm gonna record a run through of where we've come so far. This hasn't had a tremendous amount of practice. This has just been us talking. So from the top to the end, I'm just gonna record a quick run through of all of that stuff. And then I'm probably gonna spend some time just practicing all of it and making it that much more solid. And then we'll come back and actually do a for real recording from the top to the bottom, um, just, just one go. Okay, so here's another run uh, from the top. Mm.
Ja, okay. So measure 20 needs some work and leading into that, not helped by the page turn, but maybe I'll just turn the score sideways. I don't have to turn any pages there. I can get two pages. Okay, so the rest of this time is probably gonna be spent me just practicing uh, getting this ready and then we'll cut to um, a final performance. All right, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I, f I hope it's been a, a neat look into my brain and the brain of a concert pianist that there's so much more going on than, we're t than talking about learning notes and rhythms, right? There's, this is a real deep dive into just these two pages of music and all of the stuff that's going on and what I'm hearing to highlight and when I'm hearing it in the process and all that stuff. So I hope it was informative and maybe helpful for you or if nothing else, just enjoyable to see the process maybe from a different perspective. And uh, if you got something out of it, please consider subscribing to the channel, ding that notification bell and give this video a thumbs up. And um, yeah, I'll see you in a few seconds for the finished performance.